Hello, and welcome to Storytime for Grown-Ups. I'm Paul, a librarian at Avalon Library, part of LA County Library, and this is our series of story times for everybody, not just kids. Everybody wants a story now and, a t now and again, so I have some fun stuff for all ages. Kids are welcome too. Nothing here is anti-kid, uh, but I think this is for everybody to just relax at this time and enjoy hearing some fun stuff. I'm going to start today with a little selection from uh, The Goops by Gillette Burgess. This was a book of etiquette written, oh, in the 1900s. It's so old and it's so ridiculous, but it's really funny. So I thought I'd read you a couple of good manners tips from Gillette Burgess's The Goops and How Not to Be Them. The goops, they lick their fingers, and the goops, they lick their knives. They spill their broth on the tablecloth. Oh, they lead disgusting lives. The goops, they talk while eating, and loud and fast they chew. And that is why I'm glad that I am not a goop, are you? And Gillette Burgess did some wonderful art for his, uh, his goops. Uh, here is a picture of the goops sitting at their table. You see the goops are little kids with big bald heads. Kind of scary. Continuing. The goops are gluttonous and rude. They gug and gumble with their food. They throw their crumbs upon the floor and at dessert they tease for more. They will not eat their soup and bread, but like to gobble sweets instead. And this is why I oft decline when I am asked to stay and dine. Yes, well, very good. Very ill-mannered goops. The goops. Goops lead traces. Excuse me, I'll start over one more time. Goops leave traces everywhere. Gum stuck underneath the chair. Muddy footprints in the hall show that goops have been to call. Shoes and stockings on the floor show where goops have been before. And here is another picture of the odious goops and how they're driving some well-meaning adult to distraction. How terrible, how terrible the goops are. I'm glad we are no longer goops in our wonderful American culture. Next, I'm going to read you a passage from 1666, believe it or not. I'm going to read you a little selection from the Diary of Samuel Pepys. Um, he lived in London in the 17th century. He saw the Great Fire of London. He saw the Great Plague of London, which might be worth hearing about some other time. He saw the restoration of the monarchy. Uh, and he wrote about it every day as it happened. It is the closest thing you can imagine to the first blogger, because he just kept a thing every day. Uh, you know, what he saw, what he did, it's amazing. So I thought I'd read you a quick passage about the Great Fire of London. This took place, this is Tuesday, September 4th, 1666. Up by break of day to get away the remainder of my things, which I did by a cart at the iron gate, and my hands were so few that it was into the afternoon before we could get them all away. Sir William Penn and I to Tower Street, and there met the fire, burning three or four doors beyond Mr. Howells, whose goods, poor man, his trays and dishes, shovels, etc., were flung all along Tower Street in the kennels, and people working therewith from one end to the other, the fire coming on through that narrow street, on both sides, with infinite fury. Sir William Batten, not knowing how to remove his wine, did dig a pit in the garden, and he laid it there. And I took the opportunity of laying all the papers of my office that I could not otherwise dispose of. And in the evening, uh, Sir William Penn and I did dig another pit, and put our wine in it, and I my Parmesan cheese, as well as my wine and some other things. This night, Mrs. Turner, who, poor woman, was removing her goods all this day, good goods, into the garden, and, who, and knows not how to dispose of them, and her husband, uh, they supped with my wife and I at night in the office, upon a shoulder of mutton from the cooks, without any napkin or anything, in a sad manner, but we were merry. Only now and then, 
walking into the garden, saw how horridly the sky looks, all on a fire in the night, was awful enough to put us out of our wits, and indeed it was extremely dreadful, for it looks just as if it was right at us, and the whole heaven is on fire. I, after supper, walked in the dark down to Tower Street, and there saw, saw it all on fire at the Trinity House on that side, and Dolphin Tavern on this side, which was very near us, and the fire with extraordinary vehemence. Now begins the practice of blowing up the houses on Tower Street, those next to the tower, which at first did frighten people more than anything. But it stopped the fire where it was done, it bringing down the houses to the ground in the same places as they stood, and then it was easy to quench what little fire was in it, though it kindled almost nothing. Mr. Hewer this day went to see how his mother did, and comes home late, telling us how he had been forced to move her to Islington, her house in Pie Corner being burned down, so that the fire has got so far that way, and all the way to the Old Bailey, and was running down to Fleet Street, and St. Paul's is burned, and all of Cheapside. I wrote to my father this night, but the post office being burned down, the letter could not go. So you see, this was from 1666. They had disasters then, too. I'm going to finish off with a, a little play, a little passage from The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde. I think this is about uh, sort of a pridey thing to do, and I'm very pleased to be able to offer you a little bit of uh, public domain uh, Oscar Wilde. Uh, I'm going to recite the scene uh, where, uh, from Importance of Being Earnest, where Jack uh, tries to uh, get the, the blessing to marry Gwendolyn from uh, the domineering Lady Bracknell. Uh, I do not have somebody to appear as Lady Bracknell, so I am once again forced to use my uh, steady standby, my puppet bin. Hello. And so today I am introducing you to my iguana puppet, who will be assaying the role of Lady Bracknell. You may take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Uh, thank you, Lady Brackdall. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men, although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Yes, I, I must confess, I smoke. I am glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. What sh which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. <gasps> I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tempers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. If, 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 if fortunately in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes. What is your income? Um, between seven and eight thousand a year, uh, mostly investments. I have a country house with some land, of course, it's attached to it, about fifteen hundred acres, I believe, but I don't depend on it uh, for any real way for my income. In fact, <laughs> as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people who make anything from it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Uh, well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a townhouse, I suppose. A girl with simple, unspoiled nature like our dear Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, uh, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Oh, of course, I can get it back whenever I like, uh, at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I do not know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She is a lady considerably advanced in years. Hm. Nowadays, that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. 
that is the unfashionable side. I, knew, I thought there was something. However, that could be easily altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary. What are your politics? I'm afraid I really have none. Hm. Now to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who was your father? He was an, evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce, or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I, I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was, well, you see, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Cardrew, an old gentleman of, of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me, gave me the name Worthing, because he happened to have a first-class ticket to Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. In a handbag? Uh, yes, Lady ba Bracknell. I was in a handbag, a somewhat large leather handbag with handles on it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did Mr. James or Thomas Cardrew come across this ordinary handbag? Um, in the cloakroom at Victoria Station. Um, it was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom? At Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial! Mr. Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life. Oh, my goodness! I would strongly advise you. Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible, to make a definite effort to produce any, at any rate, one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I can possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Lady Bracknell sweeps out in majestic indignation. Good morning. And that is story time for grown-ups. I thank you for watching the eccentric spectacle and look forward to seeing you again next time. Stay well and visit lacountylibrary.org for information about your local library. Thank you.